Targeting Truth Spiritual GPS Welcome back to another episode of Targeting Truth. So far in our series on spiritual GPS, we've established the problem of sin. We've seen that a person's sin separated from God, and there's no way that we can remove that barrier on our own. We've also looked at the good news. The good news that Jesus died for our sins, rose, and ascended into heaven. We've asked the questions under the terms of the New Testament. What must I do to be saved? And we've allowed the scriptures to answer. We've seen that the scriptures are very direct and clear on this point. We must believe. We must repent. We must confess Jesus as Lord. And we must be immersed into Christ in order to have our sins forgiven. In our last two episodes, we've looked with detail at the first two steps. We've talked about what it means to really believe in Jesus and everything that he has said and everything that is said concerning him in the scriptures. And we've also looked at what repentance means. It means to change our mind, to change our thinking, and that change in thinking results in a change in action. Today we want to focus in on confession that Jesus is Lord. Confession that Jesus is Lord is one of the conditions that the scripture places on our salvation. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is traveling back from Jerusalem, and Philip comes up to him, and they start having a conversation about the scripture that he's reading. And Philip opens his mouth, and beginning from that passage out of Isaiah, he preaches Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. As they're going along the road, they come to some water, and the eunuch says, What prevents me from being immersed? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, one of the things you might notice, if you're using the New American Standard Bible, Acts chapter 8, verse 37 is in brackets. If you're using something like the NIV, you might not even be able to find Acts 8, 37. And then you look at the bottom of the page and you see, okay, down there at the bottom of the page, there's a little note, verse 37. The reason behind this is that some of the early manuscripts in the Greek don't have this verse. But I do have a backup scripture that makes the same point. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it tells us that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So both from Acts 8, 37 and Romans 10, 9 and 10, we see the confession that Jesus as Lord is necessary for salvation. When we say confession, what are we talking about? Well, the word confess comes from a Greek word, homologeo, which you break it down and simply put, it means to speak the same thing. In other words, we're agreeing. We're agreeing that Jesus is Lord. We're confessing, we're acknowledging, we're declaring that Jesus is Lord. I want to be very clear. We are not talking here about confession of sin. Nowhere in the New Testament, in terms of the conditions for salvation, does it ever say that we confess our sin. And that's something later that we can do to the Lord, and He forgives us our sins. But in reference to salvation, when it's, it's talking about confession, it's confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. The scripture is speaking of a declaration concerning the identity of Jesus. And so what does this mean? How does this work? I want to be clear that it's not about saying the magic words or getting the perfect order. I have an example. One time, uh, my Toyota Highlander, I needed a, a new key for it. And it was one of those chip keys. It took me a while to realize... But instead of buying an expensive chip key from the Toyota dealership, I realized I could buy a blank chip, the right kind off of the Amazon, and then there's some tricks to be able to program it. And the tricks were a little complicated. You have to pump the brake a certain number of times, roll down your window, close the door, open the door, you know, turn on your blinker, pump the brake. I, I forget all the exact order of that. But you had to get this order within the right time frame, and, and do it perfectly in order to get it to program this chip. 
That's not what we're talking about here with confessing that Jesus is Lord. It's not about the magic words. It's not about getting the order perfectly. It is acknowledging verbally who Jesus is, putting it on public record that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so when we look at the verses of Acts 8.37 and of Romans 10, 9, and 10, there are three key terms that come up. We see that Jesus is the Christ. We see that Jesus is the Son of God. And we see that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch made that confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That comes from the, the Greek word Christos. In the Hebrew equivalent, the Old Testament equivalent to our New Testament word Christ, the Old Testament equivalent is Messiah. And what both those words mean is the anointed one. In other words, when we are confessing that Jesus is Christ, we are saying that he is the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies of him as the coming king. We are, what we're saying in simple terms, Jesus is king. Now we also find out that the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, this is a little more hidden in the prophecies, but that also is there back in the Old Testament. The, the prophecies of Jesus' birth. I'm just going to key in on Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us that a child will be born to us, a son will be given. And that son's name is really interesting. His name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Bottom line, when we say that Jesus is the Son of God, we're acknowledging that God had this plan to send His Son into the world, the Incarnation, God coming in the flesh. Through Jesus' resurrection from the dead, He was declared to be God's Son. Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 lets us know that, that in that resurrection, He was declared with power to be the Son of God. And so good, the good confession includes not only that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the promised Messiah who is coming, but also acknowledging that Jesus is the Son of God. And then the other key term we get from Romans 10, 9, and 10, Jesus is Lord. Now in the Old Testament, there were two words, two Hebrew words used for Lord. There was Adonai, which means Master or Lord, and certainly, uh, maybe the way we would use the example of a knight, we would call him Lord so-and-so. Well, when we confess Jesus as Lord, it certainly includes the reality that Jesus is our master. But it's more than that. There's another Hebrew word for Lord, and that a, a different one, and that's Yahweh, or sometimes you hear that as Jehovah. And Yahweh is the name for God. When, when God told Moses, Moses asked the question, Whom shall I say sent me? God said, You tell the people, I am sent you. I am who I am. When we say Yahweh or Jehovah, we're saying He is the great eternal God. So when we're confessing that Jesus is Lord, we're, that, this concept actually that Jesus is Yahweh is also included in this. Many New Testament examples, I'm just going to pick one. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21. Acts 2, 21 is Peter's preacher on the day of Pentecost. He's quoting from Joel. And he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now you can go back and check that out in Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And what you find is the word for Lord there, where this quotation comes from, that word for Lord is Yahweh. As Peter goes on his message, he gets to Acts chapter 2, verse 36, and he says, Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom he crucified. The context where Peter says that God has made him Lord, that context is in reference to calling on the name of the Lord the reality that Jesus is Yahweh. You could also do a quick comparison of Isaiah chapter 6 with John chapter 12, verses 36 through 41. And you can establish that very definitively from those two passages that Jesus is Yahweh. 
what I'm driving at is that maybe I could use an example here. Early in Jesus' ministry, the apostles did understand and recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. Nathaniel, when he first hears the news about Jesus and he asks, well, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And then Jesus tells him, when you were, when you were, when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you, I saw you. And then the statement that Nathaniel makes, he says, you are the king of Israel. But he also says, you are the son of God. You're the son of God, the king of Israel. Nathaniel, early, from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, recognized that the Christ was going to be the son of God. But following Jesus' resurrection, there seems to be another level of understanding. When Jesus appears to the apostles following his resurrection, if you remember, the first time Thomas wasn't there. And so when the rest of the apostles are telling Thomas about Jesus' appearance, he says, no, I, unless I see, unless I see the, the imprints of the nails in his hands, unless I stick my hand in his side, I won't believe. And then Jesus shows up again later when Thomas is there. And he tells Thomas, come here, look, see, go ahead, stick your finger in here. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Following Jesus' resurrection, there's an increase in understanding of the apostles. And we see it here in Thomas. He understands that Jesus is indeed God, that he is Yahweh. And so when we confess Jesus as Lord, bottom line, we're saying he is the Christ. He's the promised Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is Yahweh, or Jehovah, God who came in the flesh. Now, when we make that confession, it's a really big commitment. You know, the first century church, during the time of the first century, when, when a person would make that confession that Jesus is Lord, he basically was signing his death warrant. You can think about it early on, Saul, before he becomes the Apostle Paul. Saul is the persecutor of the church. And he's going, he's arresting Christians and bringing them back as prisoners to be punished because from his perspective, they're committing blasphemy by saying that Jesus is Lord. And so they're being put to death for their confession, Jesus is Lord. Later on in the first century, now it's not so much the Jews, it's the Romans. And we can look at the example again of the Apostle Paul. Now he's beheaded by Nero. And the reason that he's beheaded is for that confession that Jesus is Lord. Maybe today, if you're living in the United States of America, it's not that difficult to confess that Jesus is Lord. But there are places around the world. When you're in Saudi Arabia, you confess Jesus is Lord. You might be signing your death warrant. It doesn't matter where you live or when you've lived. God requires the same level of commitment when we make this confession. I want to close here with just a couple of quick examples. There was a gentleman I was Bible studying with one time, and we met in his place of work about an hour. I think we would meet at 6 a.m. financial side of a car dealership, and our study would be going great until people would start coming in, and he just wanted to shut it down right away. And I couldn't figure out, what what is the hang-up with this guy? Why is he so worried? He's, as soon as anybody else comes in to find out that he's been studying the Bible and then come to find out his mom was a Jew. And for him to confess that Jesus is Lord or even have an interest in this was going to create a lot of strife between him, him and his mom. And so at that point in time, he wasn't willing to make that confession. Another example, there was a well-known rock band and they were asked in an interview, the lyrics of their songs had some biblical words. And so they were asked, are you guys a Christian band? And their response is, no, we're, we're not a Christian band. We're a mainstream band. So then they said, well, are you guys Christians? And the response was pretty telling. The answer from this band is, we think that's a personal question. In other words, they weren't willing to put on public record that they believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that doesn't fly under the terms of the New Testament. It's not to be kept a secret. Confession that Jesus is Lord, when we make that good confession, we are putting on public record 
that we verbally agree that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Son of God, that he is our master, and that he is Yahweh. Third step, we know we got a belief that who Jesus is, that he is who the Bible says he is. We must repent, change our thinking, and we must confess that Jesus is Lord. This is important. It's one of the steps for salvation. He's the Christ, he's the Son of God, and he is Yahweh. Join us for our next mini-series of GPS as we take a look at God's teaching about baptism. Episode 1, Baptism is Immersion. Targeting Truth, Spiritual GPS.